Mm. You're alive, folks. So uh, let's wait for people to filter in. We have uh, zero. No one's in at the moment. We're very unpopular guys compared to Eddie. So Yes. I was actually, I, I, it's so cool how uh, Eddie has the ability to play guitar because when you're mm-hmm. waiting for people to filter in, it's so weird just to stand there and not have any. Yeah, I could, I could grab a guitar, but um, my guitar is probably massively out of tune right now. Okay. So <laughs> I don't think listening to me tune for a while is going to be as exciting as hearing Eddie play. He's gotten really good in a short amount of time, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's uh he's the sort of person that when he sets his mind to something, he's serious. <clears throat> but I can tell. That comes from I think it comes in part from the sports ethics from from wrestling. Um, I we we always talk about this how sports helped us develop certain virtues that we think are um, both incompatible with capitalism and compatible with like a, a socialist ethic. Um, it makes sense. You're, you're forced to play on a team, to be part of a collective. Uh, and it's just, it's not all about you. That's sort of how music was for me. Uh, I played sports a bit. I, Fun fact, I, I played a little bit of football in college. I was a punter. Um, I never actually made the team to play a single game, but I did uh, punt on the practice squad. So that was cool. Sweet. Well, yeah, music was the exact same way. I had to work with other people and realize it wasn't just about me. Yeah, yeah. And it's um, it promotes a healthy form of competition, which is that we never – and it's it's in some of the laws, like in some of the NCAA laws, the cheering that you do in baseball, it can't be against – it can't be in favor of the failure of the other team, right? Mm-hmm. It always has to be – you have to cheer your team. So it promotes – a healthier form of, of competition that's not based on bringing others down to bring yourself up, but it's always based on bringing yourself up as you're either neutral or also supportive of the of the other side. And it reminds me a lot of uh, of Che. I, I translated when we first when we first uh, started Midwestern Marks a lecture that Che gave to uh, the UJC, the Unión de Juventud Comunista, basically the youth league, the communist youth league over there. And he tells them that, like, you look, the communist has to be the person that's like striving to be the best at everything. But he's not, they're not doing it in a way that brings other people down and that's scheming and, and doing those cut uh, throat sort of things. Uh, but they're doing it in a way that also lifts other people up, right? So he gives the example of the classroom. Like, you better have the best grades, but you also better help your classmates that are not understanding things so that they can be better too. And I saw some of that in sports. Yeah, that's sort of, it's the way that us, Lenin used to talk to young communists in the Soviet Union in the very beginning, um, that the the, communi- the party member especially leads by example, right? The, the, the party member at the workplace is the most productive worker, but he doesn't rub it in the face of his coworkers that he's the best and they're the worst. He helps them become as good within the, the, especially the early party atmosphere in the Soviet Union. That was just what it took to be a party member is you, this was expected of you. It wasn't a sort of free ride to be lording everything over people. It was a commitment and a duty to your fellow working class people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just recently saw um, it was inspired by a New York Times article that someone shared on my Facebook. Um, but it's this Cuban movie from 1974. I can't remember what it's called. Um, the movie itself is beautiful. I sent a, you know, one of these podcast voice memos to Eddie that we usually send each other. You're lucky you don't have that option as, as an on iPhone older. Um, but I the one of the interesting things of the movie is the. Uh, the segments it shows of volunteer work in in the weekends and um, it depicted it in such a way so that the person who worked the hardest clearly was the inspiration of everyone else right so like what's perceived as as cool right is not slouchiness it's not the people that scheme their way 
uh, from not doing things and, and that sort of atmosphere that's predominant here. Like in school, the, the cool kids were the ones that, you know, didn't really care mm-hmm. <laughs> and they wouldn't do things and they would skip school and all that. And in the movie, the way that it depicted what cool was, was the, the person who worked the hardest in the, in the voluntary schools. And um, that's what was admired. That's what was seen as, as something to aspire to. That's fantastic. And I, I really see it as something we should emulate from communists in other countries. So often these days, especially, people try to pull themselves up at the expense of everyone else. Yeah. And to me, that seems antithetical to the way a communist should conduct themselves, right? Even if this isn't the standard yet, mm-hmm. we need to start somewhere and we need to be an example, just like the, the Cuban communist, just like the cool kid in school in Cuba, just like the Soviet uh, Stakhanovite, that we are not... Um, someone that's going to try to perform a superiority. Mm-hmm. And if we are more productive or working harder than someone else, it is then our duty to help them achieve what we can and lead by example rather than, you know, rubbing in their faces that we got all A's or finished our quota early or whatever it is. Right. And it's, uh, it, it's so relevant, especially with, um, with what's now being called like virtue signaling mm. and stuff like that. There is definitely a place for um, leading by virtue so that others emulate you. And that's a part of, I, I think, the the ethic that a, a vanguardist should have. Um, but it's so different to how virtue signaling functions under under capitalism, where it's a lot of a lot of bringing other people down in order in order to highlight yourself um, and it kind of reminds me of the the phenomenon of Rizante Mont, how, how Nietzsche formulates it. Uh, and um, this might be unpopular, but he describes that uh, what occurs in that phenomenon is a transvaluation of values where um, the previous master class morality is considered, they consider themselves good and only an after, the bad is only an afterthought of the good. Mm-hmm. And for the slave morality, since it's so, uh, since it's broiling, and resentment and its own awareness of its incapacity to be good according to the master morality standards um, the first thing it looks at is the bad for, which is no longer bad but evil it's evil it creates the category of evil and only as an afterthought does the good come about mm. uh, and that seems to be the way that virtue signaling is, is function it's evil and then the negation of that is, is the good whereas i think that the ethic of the vanguard is and, and the sort of way that I see virtue playing a role in socialist states is the opposite of that, right? It's first affirmation, positive affirmation. And from that positive affirmation, that's where the, the negative is then derived. It so, only exists in contradistinction to it, right? Someone asked where Eddie was. We have him locked in a basement somewhere. At uh, my basement right now. We sort of go back basement. and forth. Yeah. yeah. Um, Unfortunately, He's too good looking and popular for us. And we needed to put him down to raise ourselves up. So, yeah, yeah, that's the, the yeah, there you go. Um, no, Eddie's a, Eddie's in a wrestling tournament. So he'll be out for, um, I think this whole week, but uh, we're going to have a conversation today specifically about a topic that has been making rounds in, in the Twitter sphere. Um, an interesting topic to discuss for, for us Marxists. Um, and uh, I hope to have a conversation later on this week with Noah, myself, um, Tom Riggins, who's our editorial counseling, a uh, senior editorial counselor, and um, hopefully someone else that uh, has militated in the Spanish Communist Party before. And the topic I'm hoping for that one is, uh, is going to be Euro communism, but specifically tied to uh, Carrillo's book on, on, on Euro communism. Carrillo was the head of the Communist Party of Spain for uh, during the time of that switch towards Euro communism. So we hope to talk about that current, um, what its relevance is today, how it arose, and uh, how it's really unfolded in Spanish politics. So uh, look out for that later this week. But yeah, today, Noah, do you want to 
introduce sort of the the topic, how it arises, the debate, because you you brought it up to me. I had no idea this was going on on Twitter, but I think it's a great topic for us to for us to talk about. Well, here's the thing: in 2022, we've gone through a period of of defeats in class struggle, and especially after our interview with Professor Rockhill, we see sort of how that 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 formed and what uh, what shape it took. Um, but this presents us with a few unique problems where there's a lot of people that really want to get involved, learn Marxism, and be part of the, the concrete cr- class struggle. But we've gone through two periods basically now where, oh, Carlos left us. I hope he comes right back. No, 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 I'm, I'm there. I'm oh, just highlighting your okay. face. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so um, we've, we've sort of skipped over having a large and well-publicized Marxist analysis of class as it changes over time, what our specific forms of X, Y, and Z are. And it's gotten to the point where none of us can even decide what the proletariat itself is. And this is compounded by the fact that Marx, and here's the key for a lot of people where where we get tripped up, Marx uses the word proletariat differently in different contexts, right? And if you understand the way he was writing, especially in Capital, he's trying to sort of do the dialectical style, well, not trying to, he effectively did it, the dialectical style of writing of the day, which is where something makes itself apparent at first in one form. And you can only understand it on a deeper level after its entire process has been resolved. So there's, you know, you'll see a sort of apparent form of what we call the proletariat. And then as things are described in different ways, in different situations, using the same exact word, you can then understand the whole content of it. So really the question is, what is the proletariat and what do we think about it today in the USA in 2022? Right. That's uh, that's always been at the core of Marx's uh, life's work, whether we pick, you know, his magnus opus uh, capital uh, and look at the structure of going from abstract categories to more concrete categories, something that he is himself telling you he's doing repeatedly in the text, um, or whether we look at his life as a whole, where maybe he's doing it perhaps a little bit more unconsciously, um, but still nonetheless doing it. His understanding of, for instance, the, the phenomenon of alienation concretizes uh, from 44, which is the only thing that most people read, um, to the, the later economic writings. Um, the same thing with uh, exploitation, class, all of these central concepts to Marxism, they concretize as he's able to uh, study more, engage in political praxis more. Uh, so it's 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 a one of the more common flaws that I see is people just picking these specific moments and reifying them and removing them from the context, from the process uh, in which the moment is imbued and trying to abstract a, a universalistic truth from this particular moment. That happens a lot with Marx and Engels and it happens a lot with, en- with uh, Lenin specifically. <clears throat> and with Lenin more so when it comes to tactics uh, where people are not able to realize where, um, wh- wh- what what is tactics and, and what is strategy, what is specific to the concrete moment that he's studying and, and reacting to, and what is principle, what is something more um, broad. So, I think that. Um, so yeah, let's start. Let's start with the with the proletariat. How how would you approach the? Well, first, sort of, oh, can you yeah. the outlay of what the debate. Uh, has looked like what have the what, mean positions been and stuff. So what I see is it's our tendency to want an empirical universal definition of a word or a thing that works in every instance, no matter what. We want Marx to have said the proletariat is X, Y, and Z, and then we apply it to our world as is and see if X group is proletarian or Y group is not. That's not how Marx views it. What Marx was doing 
was describing the contradiction of society as it developed. So he's saying over time, this group seems to be taking on these characteristics. This is what I believe it's due to. And here's how these characteristics gain themselves. It stands in contradiction to this other class here. So with the proletariat, we have a few different things that Marx absolutely said that people are saying contradict each other in choosing one, right? Um, one of the first ones is that the proletariat is basically the same as wage worker, right? Which isn't necessarily the case. The proletariat are wage workers, absolutely. And capitalism creates for itself a class of wage workers, right? But the proletariat, as it arose, developed specific um, characteristics that made it this class. And the easiest way he first describes it is that it's a class of people that arose that could only sell its labor to survive without the ability to accumulate more, forcing it mathematically with how production works to a level of societal reproduction or what he calls subsistence. And that's the first way he uses that. And that's one of the sides of this. Yeah, and that's tied to the more historical part of his analysis in Capital, right? Uh, which mm -hmm. comes primarily, it, it comes primarily after the first part, first two parts of the text. Um, but the, the historical in the sense of tracing the origins of how capitalism comes about, that comes at the end of Capital on the chapter on the secret of so-called primitive accumulation. And this is where the sort of first thinking about the, uh, this is where uh, um, existentially the, the first proletariat comes about in, in, in the modern era. And the, the essence of it is the process of accumulation by dispossession. You have people who are tied to the land, workers that, uh, producers that own their means of production and that have been living from the land and working in, um, more individualized forms than what uh, comes about in under capitalism. And then you have a process of, of dispossession, a, what's known as the process of enclosure where people are kicked out of the land in order to have those lands produce in, in a more, according to a more capitalist logic. And that uh, accumulation by dispossession creates this mass of paupers, which are the basis out of which proletarians come to exist because it's people who no longer um, own the means through which they can acquire subsistence and are forced to sell their labor power in order to survive, right? And, you know, some of the, if you read the passages of that section, the laws that come about against paupers are, are just incredibly uh, difficult to read, stomach turning. You know, if you, if you caught people in the streets begging, you can kill them, you can enslave them, you can do all sorts of things. And we're talking about Holland, we're talking about Britain, some of the major industrial powerhouses um, from, from the dawn of the of the capitalist mode of life. But that's how the proletariat arises. So that first definition, right, of someone who's forced because of a lack of the means to, uh, to be able to uh, work for their own subsistence, that's forced to sell their labor power, that's forced to work for a wage, that's sort of the first baseline definition. But as in every case of a thinker that approaches the world uh, through the medium of going from abstract to concrete categories, um, if you just examine that first part, you're lost, right? We've talked about this a few times with respect to Hegel and the first movement of being nothing, um, becoming and determinant being. If you just read that, um, you're kind of lost. And it's the same thing with Marx. If you just stick to that first most basic definition of what a proletariat is, you're not you're not there yet. You have to um, concretize it a little more because then you're forced to to tarry with the question of what it, whether a CEO is a proletarian or whether managers are proletarians. And we understand right now that there's class antagonisms between these groups. So how can they both be part of the same class? You get at contradictions like that if you just analyze things superficially, abstractly, and if you don't follow through their natural development of becoming more and more concrete. 
And I think that's what we're missing in our day is following through how these groups have moved in our country, in our society, um, and what characteristics the class has picked up and then changed as, as sort of the communities that the class has formed themselves into have created cultures and ways of thought and looking at things derived from those relations that we really don't have a choice in that happen before we get to them. Before I was in the workforce, you know, on a shop floor at all, I was already thinking in the same exact way, right? I also want to pay, pay very close attention to uh, the process of proletarianization because I think this is an overlooked process, even though it's not specifically having to do with the topic today. Uh, I'm writing a lot about it right now. And I, I think really be losing a, st a stable means of life is the essence of proletarianization. And that's what enclosure was. And that is what the death of our middle class is today. And I think that adds another level to what is the proletariat? Do we define it empirically as there are workers who do X, Y, and Z? Do we define it as a sort of essential quality that can do X, Y, or Z in one area or A, B, and C in another? How do we do this? And Marx uses this. He uses a proletariat specifically for X, Y, and Z, and then also specifically for A, B, and C. So it can get really confusing. Yeah, and I think that, that that gets at the essence of how it is that we think of universals. And by, I'm using universals in the most abstract way possible as, as basically just predicates, right, uh, concepts. Um, there's a good article that I would recommend from Ilyenkov uh, that's titled just literally On Universals. And he describes, you know, the essence of the problem of thinking of, of universals or of concepts, right, it's, uh, in in ways that just attempts, attempt to uh, add specific checklists of things that are just common to that type of thing. There's always problems with that approach. And instead, what you should do is think of universals relationally, right? And how they exist in specific concepts, in, in specific contexts and develop according to, um, to other, to the changes in its environment. And of course, those changes in its environment, um, it, it both uh, created and had itself be created by it, right? The relationship of subject to environment is, is dialectical. Um, but I think you're you're absolutely right that we we have to constantly be rethinking these things according to the developments in the relationships uh, that uh, it exists in. And that is fundamentally a shift away from looking at classification according to just what type of like work is being done, right? And, and it's a focus instead on what, what sorts of relations or what social function um, does this group of people play, right? And, and the, as you define a class. Um, so yeah, I'll, any comments? Well, right, so that let's get right into the sort of economics of it because that's the first form we can talk about in this. Marx talks about the industrial proletariat. Um, those workers that imbue commodities with surplus value, right? That would be only in the creation of commodities, the, the people putting together a widget, right? Um, there's more to the realization of value and a capitalist actually having profit in hand than just putting value into that commodity, however, he also talks about the commercial or mercantile capital aspect of this relationship. It's a, it's a whole process that can't include um, or that, that can't exclude one or the other. So industrial capital, um, the commercial or merchant or store or whatever used to buy all these commodities and then sell them. That was the purpose. And they would hire salespeople, there would be distributors, 
etc. And he goes over this. It's weird. And he begins to in volume two of Capital and then finishes up and ties it all together in three. And actually, before this, Carlos and I talked about the commercial uh, Capital for maybe an hour. Um, it can get really confusing because workers within commercial capital, like salespeople, et cetera, don't produce surplus value. But at the same time, their labor is still being exploited in the realization of concrete value in the value form or a currency, you know. Yeah. So it, it, people can get confused and sort of misunderstand that they're both essential to this combination of events that create commodity trade yeah and um I, th I think that goes back to the tendency of thinking of, of things divided by hard and fast lines because for instance industrial capital um, industrial capital is composed of three phases of capital money capital commodity capital and um, productive capital which mm -hmm. is productive capital that's where surplus value has the potential of being created right um, but Marx is very clear that there's this uh, this bifurcation that is necessary in the working class uh, be between those that participate within the moment of production uh, as a, the labor power factor of productive capital, um, which just for a quick overview for the audience, um, the formula in essence is you have money capital that's traded in uh, that's exchanged for commodity capital, um, and that's still within the sphere of circulation. Uh, the commodities that the capitalist buys are the means of production and labor power. And then there's a transition towards the moment of production uh, in productive capital, which uh, creates the conditions for uh, new commodities to be made that are have more value than what was inputted into uh, the productive capital than the cost of production. And they have more value, of course, because of exploitation, because surplus value was extracted. And then that commodity that has a greater value than the cost of production has to be realized again into money, which is more money than the initial money, right? Um, now, let, let, me, at the end. let me interrupt real quick, because there's a bit I meant to say, hey, I'm sorry, Carlos. Um, the industrial capitalist must presuppose the commercial capital going into this as he's producing or as the workers are producing and he's running this. So all yeah. of this is already within the calculation for them. It's yeah. not like added on top. Go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Like it's the, you, there's labor that is understood that has to be outside of the moment of production within the moment of circulation. And that is essential for the realization of surplus value. Although it doesn't create value, it is necessary for the realization of that value. And the capitalist, if, it, if the capitalist just has surplus value created without being able to realize it, you know, they, there's no point in it, right? The point of creating surplus value so that the capitalist can realize it. Um, and so that the ultimately the commodities that are made that are that have within them imbued that surplus labor um, so that they can be realized into money and then so that the cycle of, of reproduction of the reproduction of capital and accumulation so that that can uh, be perpetuated. And this requires, you know, uh, what Marx calls agents of circulation, right? He calls agents of production, the labor power that uh, exists within productive capital, which is that mediational moment where the circuit of, uh, of circulation is interrupted by the moment of production. There's agents of production and there's agents of circulation. And agents of circulation, he's going to argue, not that they're parasites, he's going to say that their wages come from the surplus value of productive capital, but that that is, as you mentioned, already presupposed in the process of production and nonetheless necessary and that they're still exploited. So he's going to say that people like service workers are still exploited, even though their wages, uh, pre their wages are come from the surplus value that was extracted from the moment of productive capital within that that sort of uh, circuit. Um, so it's not like a parasite, and he 
he also notices that there's a tendency as capitalism expands and, and centralizes, there's a tendency towards the greater, um, towards making more and more of the working class unproductive. Um, and today we live in, in what's you know largely being called a service economy. And this was something that Marx kind of predicted, right? Um, but he's not like, he's not looking at unproductive workers that are existing as agents of circulation that help the realization of surplus value, although they themselves do not create surplus value. He's not looking at them and saying, this is another class or these are parasites in the same way that capitalists and landlords are. He's, he's very explicit about understanding them as part of the working class, but that has been forced into unproductive labor. And he gives frequent analogies to um, the uh, domestic slave classes in both Rome and in Greece. Yeah, 100%. He, he often calls them slaves. Yeah. And I think that's really important to make sure we mention when talking about this. I also think, <clears throat> excuse me, he talks about how the, obviously the tendency for the, the wages of the, the slaves or service workers falls as centralization of capital happens. And though he didn't specifically talk about syndicates and then cartels, Lenin added, adds that, right? And Marx sort of went over, yeah, that'll happen, but he didn't necessarily see it happen, so he didn't formulate it in its entirety. Now that we have the complete consolidation of these syndicates and cartels and all of these services, all of these uh, commodities are all owned by one cartel, right? There's one bit of everything within this cartel owning every step of the process so that it's all one general lump of capital or uh, social labor, right? So Absolutely. That Absolutely. Lower, oh yeah, just one last thing. That, over, and Marx points out this over and over will lower the wage of the service worker. Mm -hmm. And that ties really well into what we have going on here right now, especially with the death of the middle class we talked about a little earlier. Because that middle class was just like the sort of middle classes of, you know, early 1900s Russia. They had a bit of stability and connection to something more than subsistence and their own value that they could keep to themselves and not be forced into only selling their labor. And the service workers of today, because that's gone now, because um, home ownership is now really more like debt traps along with all the other personal debt traps, right? Um, anyway, I, I'm gonna get really sidetracked on that, but this has forced these service workers into only this subsistence and recreation of society on a downward slope. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I just wanna address a question that popped up. Um, customer service yeah. people do provide surplus value or they wouldn't have job uh, jobs. I think that we have a tendency to talk about the creation of value and have a normative hint to it. And I've had this happen to me before we, um, Eddie, I, and, and the, some of the folks that uh, were involved in the Socialist Club we had when we were in undergrads a few years ago, we had created a system where all the Socialist University clubs in Iowa would get together and try to coordinate events so that uh, when there was something going on in one, we would go show solidarity. And anyways, we had, we had uh, one meeting where I remember that we brought up the topic of, uh, of this distinction between productive and unproductive labor. And instantly the reaction of, of one of the people was, oh no, service workers are productive, but it, it was in the normative sense. It, it was, they are productive and they are as important and essential as something else. And we have to be clear here that we're not referring to productive normatively as in non-productive or just leeches. And we're also not referring to production in, in the sense of, which is another uh, frequent misunderstanding. We're not referring to productive labor in the sense of that which makes a tangible object, right? Mm -hmm. There's productive labor that doesn't make a tangible object. Um, 
And, uh, and what determines whether something is productive or not is whether it's able to create value, to, to create surplus value, really. Um, so uh, to go back to the common customer service, people do provide surplus value. The response that, that Marxists give is that they don't create surplus value, uh, but they help the realization of the surplus value that was already created in the moment of production by productive capital. Um, remember that industrial capital has these three forms of capital within it, these three phases, so that industrial capital could exist. It needs money capital, commodity capital, and productive capital, which is itself a unity of means of production and labor power. Now, I want to read a passage from Volume 2 of Capital, just so that, because it addresses this, this question uh, nicely. Um, Mark says... Thank you for the question, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, Mark says... A certain amount of labor power and labor time must be expended in the process of circulation, but this now appears as an additional investment of capital. A part of the variable capital must be laid out in the purchase of this labor power functioning only in circulation. This advance of capital creates neither product nor value. It reduces pro tanto the dimensions in which the advanced capital functions productively. It is, and here's a very important analogy that I think is gonna help us all grasp what's going on. It is as though one part of the product were transformed into a machine which buys and sells the rest of the product. This machine brings about a reduction of the product. It does not participate in the productive process, although it can diminish the labor power, et cetera, spent on circulation. It constitutes merely a part of the cost of circulation. Um, so I think I think that's a good way to describe. It's an essential part of producing things, um, but it's not the variable that allows for the creation of value, right? Um, and that machine analogy is one that Marx also uses with regular productive labor, um, and it helps you think about things in a way that's somewhat disconnected from that normative lens that's uh, that's always imbued when you talk about a specific form of work as being unproductive. I think a lot of people, when someone says unproductive labor, they think of their coworker who doesn't do shit and makes them do their job for them, right? <laughs> yeah. That's not what we mean, right? Like I'm, I'm a carpenter and there are plenty of people I work with who I have to do their entire job for them. They're still performing productive labor, right? At the same time, there could be an entire restaurant full of the best waiters you've ever had, right? But that's just not productive later labor according to value creation. They're still productive in the colloquial sense. They're doing a whole bunch to, you know, make sure they earn their wage because this is an earned wage, right? Uh, I, I can get into unearned and fictitious capital later because I think that really coincides with the modern class landscape. But they're not productive in the industrial sense. Yes, and, and Marx also wants to make a distinction uh, between the agents of circulation themselves. So be, between the workers that are working outside of the moment of production, of that uh, moment uh, of that phase of productive capital in the, in the whole circuit of industrial capital. Um, he wants to make a distinction between the work that um, is presupposed as productive work and uh, one of the key examples here is transportation. Like um, he, he considers that both within uh, circulation, but also as productive, as creating uh, value. Um, and he wants to distinguish that form of work within the sphere of circulation from uh, what he calls the pure agents of circulation, the pure agents of circulation. And the example of that would be like cashiers, which are just in a position uh, that facilitates the immediate transfer of commodity for money. Um, and I think it's always important to remember that, again, there's no hard and fast lines. So the example that we were talking about earlier, uh, if you have a pizza joint that only does delivery, that delivery person is working as an agent of circulation, but they're functioning within both of these roles because their job at delivering that's the transportation element, which Marx considered to be integral to or, or presupposed in productive capital. But they're also doing 
the job of the pure agent of circulation, which yeah. is facilitating the immediate transaction between commodity and money. So especially in our economy that there's, it, it creates, it facilitates the sort of mix classing of, of, or, or of the mix functioning of various uh, activities within the larger working mass. It's important to remember that um, whenever we try to just reduce things to one thing, it's you're usually not going to be right. It's always a little mixed in and meshed with a little bit of something else as well. There's also plenty of jobs and workers that do some productive labor and some unproductive labor, yeah. right? And so how do you classify that individual? Well, the answer is you don't, right? Because this are, these are general categories and they're not meant to be put on an individual basis. Right. So like if you have, uh, if you're, I, I don't know why pizza keeps coming back. It's my favorite food. You must be hungry. Yeah. Well, I just ate. I, sh I shouldn't be thinking about pizza, but pizza is <laughs> usually what's on my mind, either pizza or Hegel. Um, but I, if you have yeah. someone making pizzas. We should we should start a company called Pizza Hegels, right? Pizza you know how they have those pizza bagels? We'll do yeah. pizza Hegels, and it'll be like the little Snapple bottle caps with the little sink. Uh, I've seen the, the memes that are like Hegel bagel or Hegel. On, you've heard of mm -hmm. Elf on a Shelf. Uh, watch out for Hegel on a bagel. <laughs> it's a picture of Hegel on a bagel. But if you have a if you have a pizza joint and you have someone in the back making pizzas, they're participating in productive uh, labor. But then if that same person goes to ring you up, then they're participating in unproductive labor within the moment of circulation. So none of these things are fixed, uh, determinate things that you know uh, they bleed the one into the other. They interpenetrate. Um, in a lot of the functions of, of jobs in our modern capitalist society. Yeah, 100%. And I think it's really important to understand that a lot of the characteristics that form what we think of as class are cultural now as well, that come from the community these relations create. And that's why... You know, when we think of working class, we think of someone wiping sweat off their brow in a factory, right? Mm -hmm. And when we think of white collar, that's sort of a, an intellectual laborer, right? Still a wage worker, but not something we'd call proletarian in a colloquial way like that. Yeah. And um, someone here uh, someone here talked about the relations themselves or what make your class. That's absolutely right. And it's not just limited to the relations a group has to production, but Marx, as he writes in the 18th Vermeer, he also hints at cultural relations, which distinguish one group, one class from another. That's what I was referring to, actually. Okay, so I have the quote here uh, to read it real quick. Uh, he said, uh, the smallholding peasants form a vast mass the members of which live in similar conditions, but without entering into manifold relations uh, with one another. The mode of production isolates them from one another instead of bringing them into mutual intercourse. The isolation is increased by France's bad means of communica communication and by the poverty of the peasants. Their field of production, the small holding, admits of no division of labor in its cultivation, no application of science, and therefore no diversity of development, no variety of talent, no wealth of social relations. Each individual peasant family is almost self-sufficient in its direct, uh, and, and, and it itself directly produces the major part of its consumption and thus requires its, uh, and thus requ requ acquires its means of life more through exchange with nature than in its intercourse with society. I think I might have the, the wrong quote. Ah. Okay, I have the wrong quote. So yeah, it was a little, that's okay. We got a super chat while you were reading that, if you want to read that. Oh, we yeah, can no. go back to the 18th. Oh, shit. Thank you, uh, Frick Frack. That's a good name. Uh, thank you for the like, uh, odd question. Currently serving in the armed forces, became a lefty while under contract. How does my labor get labeled in comparison to all these terms? Um, you know, how, how would you approach that, Noah? Marx actually talks about these, um, the military being aside from all that. 
it's weird because there are a lot of categorizations we use that don't fall into the big contradiction of society, which is proletariat and bourgeoisie. And mm -hmm. just like a sort of, you can be petty bourgeois for a bit, but you're almost certainly falling back down into the working class. Um, that's sort of how the military is looked at, which is one of the reasons in the Soviet Union, they spoke of the organized proletariat and soldiers' deputies, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're still doing work defending the country or whatever you do in the military, um, but you're not creating any value and you're not engaging in commodity production or in our era in debt production or anything like that, right? Yeah, and it also, it's it's so wide, uh, like the, the military, there's so many different functions and, and sorts of jobs that you can have within it because um, it creates almost like its own separate economy. And I think that uh, what people usually think, uh, what, what almost immediately comes to mind is armed bodies of men, of you know agents of, of repression of the state. That's not necessarily the case, especially with how diversified the, the militaries uh, are. So there's different classes within the military and the armed forces. So I guess it would depend on um, where in the armed forces you are, because that, um, yeah, it's 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 got its own sorts of uh, sort sort of division. But um, I was able to find the quote. It was on the same page, but in the yeah. Let me okay. say two more things about this one. This super chat. Um, one, class isn't really about individuals, right? Yeah. Two, you as part of a group, if the armed forces isn't your life's work, it's the community that gave birth to you, that nurtured you, that you learned how to think, what your reactions are, your subconscious, your social consciousness was formed by how you grew up and our armed forces is almost fully proletarian because it's a way sort of out of the ghetto. That was literally the slogan they used at my high school was get out of the ghetto, join the army. Horrible, but whatever, you know. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And that hits on the nail of the quote that was on the, on the same paragraph, but in the other page. That's why I got confused. But it says... Uh, and, and this is from Marx's 18th Premier, a beautiful political text where he has a very concrete analysis of the plethora of classes at play uh, in uh, from, from the development of the French Revolution up to 1848. Um, he's going to say that insofar as millions of families live under economic conditions of existence that separate their mode of life, their interest and their culture from those of the other classes and put them in hostile opposition to the latter, they form a class. So that's not just thinking about class in terms of a group's relation to production, but also realizing that that relation itself cultivates communities and that there's a communal dimension of class that's tied to culture, it's tied to interest, to the ideas that before you're even um, conscious uh, that you are building consciousness uh, through, that's mediating the, the process of developing consciousness, that is, that is also a very important um, determination in, in thinking about class. And I think that uh, one of the things that Marx does when he refers to proletariat, if you look at his body of work, he refers to proletariat, as we said at the beginning of the conversation, in so many different ways, right? He refers to, he, he talks about an agricultural proletariat, industrial proletariat, country proletariat, town proletariat, rural proletariat. So it's we, what's the proletariat? Well, it seems to be something that it, it's, it has an, an abstract definition that then exists concretized in reality through different forms of determinations according to the different relations in which it exists, amongst which are not just relations to production, but also cultural relations, right? You can have the same sort of work in, uh, in a town and in a country setting or in a rural and urban setting, the same sort of work, but the communities would be completely different. So there's, there's small differences in form, even though the substance of the class is going to be essentially the same. Right. I often think about it like if you grow up in the city or the countryside, you are not 
looking at things and thinking the same way as the people who grew up in the suburbs, right? That's sort of, a lot of people refer to it as uh, these days as the PMC or professional managerial class, which is sort of a catch-all. But back in Marx's day, he talked about these professionals that sort of, they do work, but it's a higher level of intellectual work, right? Um, nurses, doctors, teachers, et cetera. They're not really putting value into a commodity at all or helping distribute it, circulate it, et cetera. They're doing something different, yet they're still wage laborers. But a lot of the time they get paid enough that their community has separated from ours. And they're closer to a petty bourgeois sort of community and consciousness than we are. Yeah, right. And that gets at the, there's this division that Jacobin makes, and I think they, they take it to an extreme um, where they're thinking about class in terms Jacobin's of- Jacobin's extreme? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean Jacobin as in the-, the I know. Extreme. It was a bad joke, my bad. <laughs> no, the, the Jacobins aren't extreme. They're a good centrist, mm -hmm. good policy, good good work. Um, But he, the they make this distinction of, of thinking about class in terms of education, which is strange. I'm not sure if it's if it's been done before and if it has, it's definitely the sort of thing that uh, it comes from PMC areas. But um, without the element of, of absolutism, of, of making absolute class distinctions based on education, on who has a, you know, a bachelor's degree and who doesn't, um, there's an element of truth in that tied to the understanding of class and community, uh, because even if you function in your in your working environment under very similar conditions as someone uh, that's considered a blue collar worker, if you're a white collar worker, odds are that your culture is going to be a hell of a lot different. Right. And I think a lot of the sort of problems that we're we're finding today in organizing for socialism in the U.S. are parts of these clashes of community and culture that occur between a wider understanding of, of, of people who work or of the toiling masses of the working masses that all have similar interests against the existing order that are all exploited and, and oppressed, but who have cultures which, the, uh, which sometimes uh, clash quite a bit. And I think that those clashes between the, the PMC and, and the working class in terms of culture can be explained through some of these categories that Marx helps to bring about in, in our understanding of class. It also uh, can explain a lot of the tendency towards class collaboration, right? And l allowing the bourgeoisie to give us an excuse to sort of side with them over the proletariat, over the working classes. Um, you find a lot of that within suburbanite sort of PMC communities, um, the sort of, you know, like, the this section of the bourgeoisie shares my values so they're progressive and screw class analysis altogether right yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh someone here mentioned that uh that marx divides uh between two the, the contradiction of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat in general uh and then the petty bourgeoisie is seen as a sort of uh, inter intermediary intersecting class I think important, I think I right? I, I remember I had this class, the sociology class when I was an undergrad. I have these things that happen, that happen in, in undergrads where, in undergrad, where I, I wish I could go back and, and respond to some dumb thing a teacher said or something. But this teacher was criticizing Marx because, uh, as she formulated it, uh, Marx reduces um, everyone into two classes, either the bourgeoisie or the proletariat, and, and that's. That's absolutely wrong, right? What he is saying is that the sort of central contradiction, or to use a, a category from, from Mao, right? The primary contradiction under capitalism is, is that between the proletariat and the, and the bourgeoisie. But in all of his political works, or even in capital, in his economic works, you see the influence of a much more complex and concrete understanding of, of class that uh, plays, pays a lot of attention to these nuances and differences in which uh, in which these groups existed. Um, so the the petty bourgeoisie 
is uh, is one of these classes that's that's pretty ambiguous politically, that has a little bit of economically, a little bit of both. There's ownership, but there's also working, right? So there, it, there's a, a an intermingling of things in the proletariat and, and things in the bourgeoisie, and that intermingling, that amb ambiguous combination makes it politically ambiguous in terms of its interest. A big part of the petty bourgeoisie uh, during the commune stayed with the revolution, right? Um, in Mao's China, I, I, one of the revolutionary classes was the petty bourgeoisie, right? And also the national bourgeoisie that wasn't collaborating with the imperialists. But um, it's got that ambiguous character, I think, because it's in its class character, it's got this weird combination of both opposites uh, that are the main, the primary contradiction under capitalism. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely 100%. I want to go to the second part of this comment, though. Um, <clears throat> in Capital Volume 3, Mark says there are three classes. It, he go, it, So he'll finish set it. things like th that up in context, right? And he does talk about a landed aristocracy, right? And in the American situation, that's really important to understand that that landed ar aristocracy was destroyed, um, especially in our context, our second revolution, which was understood through Marxism as the completion of the bourgeois revolution of 1776 in 1863, with the Civil War, destroyed the slave the the slaver class or remnants of an aristocracy, and continued the bourgeois relation. However, we've gotten to this point now where monopoly runs and a growing real estate as fictitious capital creation sector of the economy is growing and nascent again. So. It's weird because I've actually seen a few economists describe this as landlords on a higher level of development, the imperialist landlord rather than the feudal landlord, mm. which I really uh, like that analogy a lot. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, this the sections where, where the last chapter, uh, as was organized by Engels at volume three, is called the Classes. And Marx gives you four paragraphs, and then the manuscript breaks off. Um, so a lot of the discussion that we're having here about uh, Marx on class um, is, is something that has to be, uh, to some extent, abstracted from different parts of his body of work, because he never sits down and systematically gives an expose of what he means by classes and what the relations between the specific classes in his time are. Right? You can abstract some of the relations uh, between these political texts and, and when they pop up here and there in, in the economic text. Um, in terms of the what you were mentioning, I think that's pretty interesting. There's a lot of these new ideas that are coming um, uh, about in terms of thinking about class. And I think that uh, perhaps one of the more interesting ones that I have yet to really sit down and, and ponder over is the one from Yanis uh, Varoufakis, uh, who, who says that we're virtually entering into a techno-feudalism um, because so much of the, um, I'm tempted to use capital, but if it's techno feudalism, I don't know if that's the right word, but so much of the capital that is actively circulating in society is of this technological character, which is governed by rents. Um, and so you, you look at like streaming platforms, right? Now we're renting this, mm -hmm. the access to the streaming platform um, Netflix and, and, and Amazon and, and or parts of Amazon at least, right? Um, so, what do you what do you think about that? Have you engaged with that material? Have you given that any thought? Uh, I haven't read his book yet, but I do have it here somewhere. It, he's it, kind of similar to Michael Hudson, who's very very big right now, and I really enjoy his analysis. He has one. Um, I think I have it right here. Yeah. Killing the host mm -hmm. of financial parasites and debt destroy the global economy. And he, he's basically explaining this. He calls him a new Rantier class, but we would have just called it parasitism 
in the classical Marxist text, right? Yeah. And the return of landlords and how monopoly rent these days is the new top dog, the new fully consolidated finance capital, as I call it. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I, um, I haven't seen that much. I've seen them in lectures and I've read a few articles from the, I think DM 25 is the, the name of the, the movement that, that he has in Greece and Europe in general. Um, but I'd be interested in seeing what, what Marx's e economists would say in, in response to that. Cause again, I'm in philosophy. I'm not an economist, <laughs> um, but a lot of these people have kept up, uh, like I have in philosophy, with some of the debates that come after uh, these uh, these economic writings. Um, but uh, yeah, is, are there any other aspects of the of the discussion that you think would be fruitful for us to um, to talk about of the debate? I think we've covered it all pretty well by this time. As usual, it's sort of. A confusion only arises because we haven't figured out a solution, yeah. right? And we can blame a lot of that on the conditions that led to this moment. But for me, I think when we when we stick to a one-sided sort of dogmatic, this, this, and this means that we're going outside the realm of Marxism. Mm -hmm. And shorthands are great. They're easy to give new people, especially. But we, we really want to understand this stuff, especially how Marx put it. We need to understand each way he used proletariat. And it turns out, like most of these big arguments with people passionately arguing for one side or the other, they're all a little correct, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's this... Uh... There's this phrase that Hegel uses in his lectures on, on religion when he's thinking about Antigone, um, Sophocles' uh, work. And um, he, he says that the sort of uh, what's been called the paradox of, of sincerity, that both options are wrong because they're one-sided and because of that, they're both right. And a lot of the times what we find in these online debates is is that right because people are picking and choosing different parts and uh for um it's it's difficult it, it's it's difficult for a lot of people to realize that um that both things can both be true and false at the same time we're so used to thinking in terms of binaries and um these are the ways that we have been taught and, and, and cultured uh, to think we were talking um yesterday you and I were talking um, in somewhat Hegelian terms of how uh, of how bad uh, capitalism has provided a fetter, not just the, to the forces of production, but to the forces of knowledge production, right? It's basically like provided a, a fetter for zeitgeist, for the spirit of the age. It hasn't allowed it to advance. Um, and, you know, a, a good example of that is like intellectual development in China and, and socialist countries where people are thought to think dialectically and where dialectic materialism is the, the norm in terms of thinking. They're able to do new things that um, we stumble upon accidentally here in the West because of the nature of scientific study sometimes uh, leads people to accidentally realize that the, the method that they're using is, is a dialectical materialist method. Um, but the reality is that when these online debates take place, I think on one end, they're good uh, because it's good to to engage with the material focusing upon one topic, right? Or one uh, problematic, one series of questions that you you want to look at. Because um, every time we read a book, uh, there's few things that stick here and there, right? And then when we reread it, we're rereading it in a context of new research that we've done and new things begin to stick. But when we're able to read it, looking for something specifically it's so much richer and we realize that there's so much more to find out about that thing that we're looking for specifically um so i think these debates when they come up they're really good but what i hate is how people en engage in these debates with each other and with different positions because it leads to to splits and i'm sorry but i don't think that like at the moment we're in in our struggle against capital and how you know how dire our struggle is with the problem of climate change and, and, and these other things that are adding new determinations that previous generations didn't have. I don't think it's for us to be fighting over these helpful 
debates, right? We should be helping each other and having an attitude of, if you find one text that contradicts me, cool, let's think about what this means. Where does this land us? And not like just chop each other's throat because we're picking each from different quotes that to verify our position. I don't think that's helpful right. and that's, that's anti-dialectical because it, it prevents, remember that the word dialectic itself comes from the, a Greek process of dialogue. And it was thought that in dialogue, through people bringing about different opinions and forcing themselves to reply to the other opinion, you're going to get yourself closer and closer to truth. Um, now, if if when someone else brings up an opinion and you don't agree with it and you don't agree with the resources, if you just back up and, and, and ignore them or call them a name and break off, you're stifling the uh, di dialectical development of, of, of knowledge. Um, so that's what I hate about it, but there's also the positive, the, the silver lining is that these debates are helpful and it allows us to do things like what we did today. We both spent our morning looking at texts that we've already read, that we've read with an eye to different things, uh, but focusing upon a, a topic in hopes of helping people who are also thinking about these questions. Yeah, I think there's a way to have debates that are good, mm -hmm. right? And the one thing that really gets to me is when they become less about the substance of the actual debate and saying, well, here's what I thought. And then someone else saying, wait, 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 wait. I thought this other thing, let's figure out what's right. Or are we both wrong? Yeah. And it becomes more about a way to posture. And at that point, I'm like, are you really interested in learning or in doing this or, or just looking cool? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Maybe it's just me and I'm old, but I, I mean, look at me. I don't care about looking cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, the one thing I realized I forgot to add in speaking about the proletariat, and I'm watching a bunch of questions go by, by the way. Um, in speaking about the proletariat, we always have to remember the proletariat is not the masses. It has never been the majority class, right? Especially the industrial proletariat. Now, as Mark said, it is destined to develop and grow. And I would say that it's, its development can go in zigs and zags and operates according to class struggle and a few other things. But we have to remember, even in Marx's time, the peasants outnumbered the proletariat at least 20 to 1. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right, right? The task of the proletariat is to lead. Um, and, and it leads not, if, if it was the only like class, it wouldn't have to lead. It would Precisely. just, right. It, to lead means that there's something being led and what's being led is the other popular classes that some are producing classes, some are non-producing classes, but that all find themselves in an antagonistic relation to the existing order and in a contradictory, but not antagonistic relation to the proletariat. Right. And the, and the proletariat is in a position to rally them to it. Yeah. And that actually answered one of the questions I just saw. It was Kyle Smallwood said, next question, does the fact that the USA has a mostly service economy mean that it cannot be revolutionary? Nope, sure doesn't, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it absolutely, that's something that, uh, that leads a lot of like, uh, um, saying that the the service sector workers cannot be revolutionary or are not exploited or are just parasites, it could lead very easily into a third world Maoist mm. conclusion, which says that the proletariat is just this sector of the working class that works in industrial production. Um, and if you define it in that limited way, then the argument is that, look, after NAFTA and after all these other programs that where capital went somewhere else in order to get cheaper labor to super exploit, the there is no proletariat here. There's just a service uh, sector of workers who are all parasites on the surplus value that's created through the super exploitation of the third world. Therefore, there's nothing we can do here. Um, it's just the revolution can only come from the third world and we just have to sit around with, with our hands in our pockets sort of thing. And that's a mistake, right? That's, that's a categorical mistake. It does what we have repeated that ends up being the mistake in most cases, which is try to define things according to hard and fast lines and 
according to a very strict form of analytical thinking that I, that I don't think is, is helpful. So, um, yeah, the proletariat is, I mean, look at the, let me see, if you can comment, but I'm going to look for a passage that I think might help folks. Sure. I think <clears throat> the, the sort of question of revolutionary potential is a societal question rather than the, the characteristics of the working class. So revolutionary potential is created by the old way no longer being possible in society, right? It, when the contradictions internal to this class society get to a point where it can no longer continue, that is when revolutionary potential in this objective process, as in it is the object we're talking about and happens concretely, happens, right? We reach a, a Hegelian nodal point of change or the revolutionary moment or, or the negation of the negation of the last one, right? Mm -hmm. So any way you want to look at it, it's a societal process and the revolutionary subject, the thing making it happen has different characteristics that we need to figure out in each time and place it happens. Absolutely. In Cuba, it, it was the campes the campesino, the mm -hmm. um, not peasantry, but like the farmers, the agricultural proletariat, right? Um, in, in, in Russia, it was a different uh, class and in, in, in China it was a different, like it's, it, it exists according to the concrete conditions of, of the place you're in. So I, I don't think that it's possible to say that something like a service sector movement could act in some way as a revolutionary class. Like we can't predict the future. There's no magic eight ball that tells us, you know, how a revolution is going to, to look right. Um, Wait, there isn't, I just wasted a lot of money then on Amazon. <laughs> if you did, I'm so poor that I, I, I'd sell you a bridge that you might be interested in. Um, but there's a there's a there's a passage in in you know one of the richest and most often overlooked chapters in, in Capital Vault One, which is Machinery and Modern Industry, Chapter 15. It's the longest chapter in all of Capital. And there's a passage right before Section Seven and Section Six, the the end of Section Six, um, and uh, he's talking about the expansion of unproductive labor, and he draws these comparison to uh, Greek and Roman domestic slaves. But at the end of it, he says, look, let's, let's just see what percentage of people uh, in the UK and England and Wales are workers. And he excludes uh, people too old or too young for work. He excludes unproductive uh, women, young children, uh, he excludes the ideological classes, which I guess Gramsci wouldn't like, you know, uh, <laughs> intellectuals <laughs> being labeled as classes on their own, but whatever. Um, government officials, priests, lawyers, and soldiers. Mm. Right? He excludes those classes. So whatever is left is what he thinks the working class proletariat is. And what's left? Well, the first group is agricultural laborers. The second group is all who are employed in cotton, wool, woolen, uh, uh, flax, hemp, et cetera, et cetera. The third group, all who are employed in coal mines and metal mines. The fourth group, all who are employed in metal works and metal manufacturers of every kind. The fifth group, the servant class, right? You know so what? if you think about it in terms of productive and unproductive laborers, the first four are productive, the last one unproductive, uh, but they're still part of the working class, the proletariat, right? He's not making a distinction and saying, look, these people are not part of the proletariat, so. I think what what's really important is how does Marx arrive at these answers? Yeah. yeah. Right. That is the question we need to answer and then apply that to our current situation. And then we find who we have to organize and how, what alliances we need to be made, need to make what we can ignore what we can say, well, these people are probably going to be counter-revolutionary. Let's leave them alone. You know? Absolutely. Right. It's uh, it's method over conclusion. That's the essence of Marxism. It's, it's the method, not the specific conclusions that are arrived at. Right. You are unfair to Marxism if you just copy and paste the conclusions from 150 years ago to today. Right. To be to be fair to Marxism, you have to realize when the context has changed and when the conclusions of 150 years ago are not the ones that we should be drawing today because the method 
tells us otherwise, right? Um, there was a good question here from Chef. Okay, um, they asked, how do we counter Starbucks just closing unionized stores? Speaking of Starbucks, the best man at my wedding, my best friend that I grew up with, um, has worked at a Starbucks since he was like 16. And they just officially got their union going yesterday. So that's pretty awesome. Hell yeah. It seems like the every place that I've lived at if, that I've lived at in, in my life has had over the last two, three months, a Starbucks unionization effort. Um, and I don't know if it's just lucky me or what, but um, it's, it's they're popping up all over the place. And um, that's yeah. how things function. It's positive feedback loops. One happens in one place and it, it leads to others. Uh, it creates the conditions for others to happen more easily, right? It doesn't do it, um, it it's not inevitable but it hmm. creates the conditions for it. I think he said 5% of all Starbucks have unions now, which if you think about how many Starbucks there are, that's a lot of fucking unions. Yeah. I'm sorry to swear, you know? I'm hoping that the same thing happens with, with Amazon. <clears throat> and Target, I heard there's Target unions starting now too. And I think it's interesting that all the spontaneous union consciousness happening right now is in this service sector right um, yeah. and amazon aside because i think the amazon warehouses are a different sector um that's big and that tells you something about re-proletarianization which mm -hmm. you can read about in my book when i finally release it yes yes <laughs> and um yeah that that's that's absolutely right um and it, it just seems so you know, there's, I, th I think it's the sentence that Marx closes out uh, one of the, either the last chapter or one of the last chapters of Capital Volume 1 with, um, but he, he talks about how much easier the revolution is going to be uh, compared to other revolutions mm. that were waged by just one small class that had to have this extra step of universalizing its class interest so that other classes, which eventually will develop to realizing that they don't have the same interests, uh, for them to think that they have that interest, right? So the bourgeois revolutions are the perfect example of this. Um, one of the things that distinguishes the proletarian revolution is, uh, is the mass character of the revolution. It's a mass revolution. Um, and if you are in a context like the US where a big portion of the working class is in the service sector, if you just scratch it out, what you're trying to reproduce is a revolution that at least in terms of scale of of, of involvement, of, of class involvement and leadership replicates numerically like the bourgeois revolutions, right? Because we don't have a very big industrial proletariat in the US, right? Um, it can't be more than 10% of, of, of the population. So uh, if, if you limit yourself to that is the working class, that's the only part of the working class that can be revolutionary, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, 100%. I'm not even sure what the percentage is, but it's it's very low. And I think it coincided with class struggle against us, right? The reason all the factories closed down was because we became effective. Yeah. Right. And so we need to find new forms of a way to struggle against the boss without that there now. Well, that gets back to the question of the the Starbucks closing down when it becomes. Mm. Effective. How do you how do you fight against that? That's such a weird thing because it, it, it affects it effectively removes the ground on which you can fight, at least immediately, the immediate sort of ring that, that you've been waging the fight on. So how do you how do you combat that? That's that's what they did to us with the factories, right? Yeah. They removed the concrete premise for our organization and everything it stood on. Um and and removed the class character of it, right? So when you talk about how do you fight that? There's one way I know of to do it. And it's you don't stop a trade union consciousness. You don't you stop at the trade union, you join the communist party. Right. And from the Communist Party, 
you unite these unions and you make sure there are communists in the lead. You make sure they are militant unions that are involved in politics. Yes, um, that's absolutely right, right? Uh, and uh, Lenin does say in left-wing communism that uh, unionization efforts and unions are schools of communism. But at the same time, earlier Lenin recognizes that without a vanguard and the ideological formation that the vanguard brings to the masses, the highest form of consciousness is trade union consciousness, and that is perfectly compatible with the existing order. Um, so it's good to see that trade union consciousness arising, but it also should signal to us that the conditions are more fertile than ever for us to get into those places where trade union consciousness, the most militant sectors of the working class is in, and to lead it towards a more revolutionary arena so that it doesn't just finish in immediate reforms, but so that it realizes that insofar as the existing order continues, it'll never really have what it wants to have, right? Right. I Here's my question. In Lenin's day, the, the top consciousness you could get without the vanguard's instruction was trade union consciousness, but we have the internet now. We don't have an illiterate um, masses. We have illiterate mass. And so I wonder how much more something like Midwestern Marx could play a role in helping educate people. Um, yeah, like, I, I just think we wouldn't have to wait for literacy programs. We start this education and people have proletarian class consciousness and socialist consciousness now before they even start the union in some cases. That's that is true, right? Right. It's it's almost as if the 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 uh, uh, expanding of trade union consciousness is already coming with a little germ of of socialist consciousness, a revolutionary consciousness, right? Um, but then that also ties to a, a similar question, at least in the technological field, that uh, a similar phenomenon to the unionized Starbucks stores closing down, uh, which is that when we get to the point where we're successful enough online and we, we get to a point where we're dangerous, right? Mm. Um, we are on their platforms. They can do the same thing that they did to the unionized workers, which is to strip them of the platform on which they are carrying on the fight. Um, and I think this is, I think, the question for socialist organizing today. You know, such a big part of it is engaging in the ideological battle in this field within this new field within the superstructure, which is technology, social media and stuff. Uh, but also realizing that uh, unlike uh, you know, some other fields, it's so easy for them to just pull the rug under us and, and have all our struggles go to shit. And of course, at Midwest Remarks, we've seen it with an account that um, that we were able to develop to close to 400,000 followers that was just removed, gone forever. Right. Yeah, I think that's a big problem. Um, it doesn't mean we don't use it in the best way we can while we can, right? But it, 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 what it means to me is that we need to develop something more, yeah. something that can use this, but become more than that. I mean, what I would like to do at some point is have a new brick and mortar school mm. or even a, a, a way to somehow bring stuff like that with the 400,000 back or get around that sort of thing and the ownership of the Silicon Valley cartel, that kind of thing. There, there's a, a world of possibility out there if we actually think about it and put our minds to it. Exactly, right. And at the end of the day, um, if everyone who's on the internet becomes a socialist, um, all we have created is the conditions for change. We haven't created mm -hmm. you know, substantial change yet. It's up to people to go ahead and organize their workplaces, organize their communities and do something beyond the education that they're getting through um, through through social media platforms and through different sorts of things like the stuff that we do in Midwestern Mark. So it's always something that we emphasize, which is please get into a party, get into an organization, put in the work, 
And if you don't have, you know, the ideal organization in your community, join whatever's there. It's always a great training tool to talk to people. And um, you can't just go up to people's houses if you're not in an organization, right? Um, so uh, join an org and, and talk to people. I know that we have uh, our disagreements, of course, with like DSA, but Eddie and I, we spent four years in DSA knocking doors, talking to people, and it was incredibly helpful, um, both at, at, at the personal level in terms of building the sort of confidence that's needed in order to talk to people about politics, which is something that's so like, eh, uh, to, to so many people, but um, also in terms of uh, learning from people and what it is that, um, that that working people need, right? And the sectors in which we had to knock doors, there were all sorts of sectors. We would have to talk to uh, people from different communities divided by race, sexual preference, gender, and we found that working people, what set them apart was the demands that they had as, as part of the working class, right? That uh, the everyday issues that they faced, whether it was a, a black person, white person, gay person, woman, man, the, the everyday issues that they faced were all, all connected to the exploitative uh, system of capitalism and to their position as, as part of the working class. Um, so those are truths yeah. that, you know, you get in books, but you don't really feel it. You don't you don't get it at the level of feeling. And uh, and and when you get it in books, it never really stirs the passion that comes about when you see it, when you when you see the misery for yourself or when you experience it. Um, so I 100 percent would recommend people getting out there and, and working in organizations in their communities and in their workplaces. What I always say is that there is no organization, no party or anything right now that is in a position to lead the working masses. That means they all have issues. Whatever mm -hmm. your issue is with it, I guarantee you there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who share that concern and will help you correct that problem within the organization. If all we do is stay outside it and complain, it ain't gonna get fixed and nothing's gonna happen. Yeah, and we have known that for a long time, <laughs> Lenin, right? Uh, so, well, it's been a wonderful conversation, Noah. I think we, we have, uh, at least to some extent, done justice to the to the debate, and I, I hope that it helps people um, and, um, and that it, it helps also, not just in terms of the content of what we have discussed, but hopefully in terms of, you know, some of the points that we've made about how it is that these debates um, or, or questions should be addressed and, mm. and hopefully uh, done in a much more comradely manner. So um, again, kinda, really good it, talk. Yeah, last thing, I'm so sorry. It's really good that they're even coming up. Yeah. It means people care and shit's moving, right? Yeah, with that, thank you, brother. I love talking to you, you know that. Thank you everybody who watched us or listened um, or listened to Carlos and tried to make out what I said and couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, folks. I uh, see you all. I hope you have a, a beautiful Tuesday. Is today Tuesday? Mm, yes. Okay. Well, anyways, I hope you all have a great day. <laughs> yes. And see you next time.